In this episode of our best of season, we are going hog wild. I'm Kat Neville, and this is Feast TV. In our first best of season, we are pulling from our archives, which go back to 2013, if you can believe that. And this particular episode is focused on all things pork. So you can obviously see in front of me a gorgeous pork loin. This one is about three pounds. And what we're going to be doing in this episode is stuffing it with a walnut, raisin, and herb stuffing. And then we're going to be wrapping that in some prosciutto and roasting it in the oven. It's a really delicious way to work with pork that adds flavor from the inside out. And so I'm going to get started with the stuffing first. This is a very, very easy recipe. Just a bunch of walnuts. It's about half a cup, about a half a cup of raisins. Then I'm going to be layering in rosemary, thyme, and also sage. Now I'm gonna add a little bit of salt right on top, along with pepper, and then I'm also going to toss in a couple of garlic cloves to my pile here, and then I'm gonna run a knife through everything. One of the reasons why you put salt in at this stage is that kind of like when you see how salt will wilt vegetables, what we're doing is by including the salt as we're chopping it, it's helping to break these ingredients down a little bit more thoroughly and start pulling all of that flavor out of them. It smells amazing in here right now, all the garlic and herbs. This is the kind of dish that is very easily adaptable to any flavors that you would want to include. If you wanted to do dates or dried apricots, if you wanted to exclude garlic and instead do onions or shallots, there are so many different ways that you can play with just this basic technique to really maximize the flavor of your pork roast. I'm gonna finish chopping up all of my stuffing, and while I do that, let's head to Iowa to meet the folks behind La Quercia, which is one of the country's best prosciutto makers. Take a look. So how did La Quercia come about? How did this, how did this start? Well, we spent three and a half years in Parma, Italy, and uh, we really, we didn't learn to make prosciutto then, but we learned to eat it, and we learned a lot about eating food and appreciating great ingredients. We did notice that there was not a lot of fine uh, cured meats in the United States, and that was sort of a step we could take the way people had with wine, with cheese, with beer. You know, it doesn't matter if you're her from Iowa or, you know, Armandino from Seattle, you know. If you give them something great to eat and actually help them understand why and where it came from, it's a great reception. One of the things that I think does help to distinguish your product is that you're using heritage breed pork. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you've done from the very beginning? We tried different pork breeds, mm -hmm. and the ones that we liked the best for specialty breeds were Berkshire and Tamworth. And why is that? We felt that the meat had the, the meat. best quality. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of the ultimate test. How does it taste? It was kind of ironic to me that the people from Italy who were telling me that we couldn't make prosciutto were the same people coming and eating meat at restaurants and saying, oh, the meat here is delicious, the best meat in, Love in the world. Meat. Yeah, You know, we heard a lot of different things about the air is important and the climate's important and the equipment's important. To us, it's really the meat. The meat's what determines it. I mean, it's 96%. You guys still get in there and salt 
the hams yourselves too. I mean, you're not just, you know, running the company, you still on a day-to-day -day basis are in there making the products yourselves. I think at this point we just like to do it. It gets long, you know, and cold. It gets long and cold, but I'm really glad we do it. I'm glad we can still do it. And I think it's it's one of the things that I value about working with our employees is that they know we take this really seriously. That's an important message to say, you know, the work that you are doing is really important work. And we're here to do it too. It's a very old process. It's been done for millennia, so it's nothing we created. But you put the salt on, the salt penetrates, it pushes the water out. So you get the meat dry enough so it can support higher temperature. Basically, we dry the meat so that it doesn't support bacterial growth. That's how it's safe to eat. And then we age it. You can see the meat starts shedding moisture. It's dripping down the edge of the racks. It's a very elemental thing. Th these are the two ingredients. This is the one chance you have to combine the two ingredients. And it's going to sit here, and then we're going to do it again, and it's gonna keep, that's going to keep on happening. So this is the winds of January. It's chilly in it's here. It's chilly in here. <laughs> so we have a lot of air movement and a lot of refrigeration power. So we're taking a lot of moisture off of those hands. Here we're continuing to dry with refrigeration. So we're in the last phase of winter. We don't have the air movement, so uh, it's slowed down. So we're gonna be in here a month. So where we were previously, it was cold like winter, and now we're in this warm, almost humid room that is something like summer, essentially. Yeah, it'll be early summer. This is incredible. Look at all of these hands. There's so many of them. They're gorgeous. And they have the paste applied. Right, so that, the purpose of that is to inhibit the moisture loss. So we've taken about as much of the water out as we want, and we want to slow it down but we want to continue to age them because uh, we want to favor that enzymatic activity that's going to break down the meat and break down the fat and create that special flavor and texture. So how long will it will they stay here with the paste on? Uh, six months, seven months. Oh yeah. And then do you just rinse it off? Yeah, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> it's more work to get off than it is to put on. So how do you get it off? You're going to see. Oh, excellent. Let's go see. <laughs> This is where we take the hams from in there and make them really, really pretty. Yes, and, and ready for sale. So Sebastian, what, what is your role? Uh, my title is the plant manager. Um, so I basically make sure everybody's in the right place at the right time so that we can make the best possible prosciutto. The device they're using is called a wizard knife. And basically all that is is a three inch circular razor blade that just spins. Um, uh, so it's a motor-driven razor, and it just goes through and shaves off the sunya. Do you ever get tired of walking through here and seeing this? No. I mean, you know, sometimes, like, almost always when I walk through here and see this, I worry. What are you worried about? We always worry about the quality. Well, but that's why you deliver such high qualities that... <laughs> We're not... always worried about it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a great job for an obsessive compulsive. <laughs> yeah. So it's fun to make the meat, and then it's delicious, so... Yeah. Everybody wins. Everybody, Everybody wins. <laughs> yeah. but that's ultimately it. If it's not delicious, you aren't going to hang it. It's, it doesn't work. You know, it has to be yeah. really good to eat. There's not, there's not a lot of point to being in the food business if you don't make something that's delicious. My visit to La Quercia was when all of the gears clicked in my head with regard to how simple and how complicated making prosciutto is. I mean, all it is is a ham that has a bunch of salt on it, but the way that it's moved from room to room and mimicking all the different seasons is just incredible. So that trip was really one that has stuck with me and it was such a, a treat to be able to get inside of the La Quercia facility and meet the folks behind that amazing product. So we already have the stuffing chopped up. I'm gonna move this to the side. Here is my pork loin. 
This is about three pounds, and you can see there's a nice amount of fat on top. I wanna to leave that intact because that's going to help to keep a lot of moisture in the roast as it's cooking. What I'm going to do is I'm going to butterfly this and open it up, and that's where we're going to be putting the stuffing. Put this on my larger cutting board. It's pretty simple to do this. You just kind of open it up like a book. And we want as much surface area as possible so that we can have all that wonderful stuffing really shine through. Okay, so we have our pork loin. I'm going to generously salt and pepper the interior. And now I'm gonna go ahead and add in my stuffing. I'm going to put just a touch of olive oil in the stuffing to help bind it. Mix that up. Press that into the meat so that it really adheres. And we're just gonna roll it up. Our loin has been stuffed. Now, what we want to do is make sure that it all stays together. So when we come back from this next segment, I'm gonna show you how to wrap that prosciutto and get this thing tied so we can pop it in the oven. But next up, we are going to go meet the family behind Circle B Ranch. This was a really fun shoot. You're gonna meet some really cute pigs. Yes, yeah, so I'm John Backus, and uh, that's my way from Reno over there. You're in Seymour, Missouri, and uh, on my hog farm, Circle B Ranch. There's old Barney. Come on. Come on. That's the biggest pig I've ever seen. He's, he's actually a, a Newman hog. Ah. Well, we always appreciated natural food. We always kept our own chickens, ducks, turkeys for our, for our own consumption because we, we trusted the food. Uh, we wanted to go into a, uh, a business where we thought it was in demand and uh, certainly natural food is in demand. Well, being pasture raised, as you can see, they're on a pasture and they're uh, given full, uh, the full ability to exercise all their instincts. And we raise our animals to certain standards. Uh, they're raised humanely and naturally, so it, uh, affords the best possible product to uh, the consumer. Can we see the babies? Yeah. While we were waiting for the hogs to grow, I, had, I couldn't get a job. No matter what I tried to do, I couldn't get a job. So um, we started making sauces. We started making a tomato sauce, a cranberry chutney, and a barbecue, which was pretty awesome. And we got them into the different stores, and it was, it was good. So then he said, one day he said, you know, hey, we're making we're making uh, tomato sauce, why don't we do meatballs? It's like sort of a no-brainer, so. <laughs> I was just watching the pigs over here, they were playing with the hose. Uh, like oh, a little yeah. toy, they were throwing it up in the air. Oh, they, they play like dogs. <laughs> They'll pick up a stick and run around with it and one has it, one tries to take it away from them. If you put a ball in there, where sometimes they'll give a a boar, one of those blue drums, plastic drums, and he'll be tossing that thing all over the place. In the beginning, I did a lot of groveling. A lot of, Please try my product, it's really good, you'll like it. Call them back, have you tried it yet? No, I haven't. You know, it's in my freezer, oh please, do it. And once they started tasting it and sampling it, and we started developing relationships with chefs in that way, a lot of chefs have are starting to call us, you know. Well, the, the gross is, is probably attributed to our name getting around. It's, it's been in enough restaurants and markets in St. Louis, Kansas City, down here, and now, you know, the name is getting out. We've held to our held to our principles and breeding, so we held to our quality standards, so people have, have tasted our product, everything from our, the hogs to our, our sauces, our specialty sauces, and they, they appreciate the quality in it. I mean, that's where it originates. If your hogs aren't happy and healthy, they're not going to produce for you. 
and they're not, you're not going to make money. So they're basically like, you know, taking care of your valued employees. So give them the best that you can. I think we've done that here. You know, our biggest concern is the natural environment for them. My favorite part of that segment is when Maria is talking and I'm just right off camera, but the pigs just kind of start weaving in and out of her legs. It was such a fun moment when you're there, but it also shows what amazing care they take of their pigs because they have a great relationship with their animals. Um, okay, so what I'm doing now is I am cutting lengths of kitchen twine that are going to be long enough to wrap around this pork loin and I'm going to arrange them on my cutting board and then I'm going to lay the slices of prosciutto on top of that and then put the loin on top of that and wrap everything around. That's the easiest way to accomplish this. So I'm gonna get that done pretty quickly and then I'll show you how to lay out the prosciutto. So I'm just laying these out at about inch, inch and a half increments. The idea is to have enough so that none of the filling falls out and the pork loin actually just retains its shape. So next I'm going to lay the prosciutto out across the twine and this is actually where we're gonna be going next. We're going to head over to Volpe, which is a historic St. Louis company, still family run. It was launched in 1902 on the hill, and you are going to love this insider's peek at how they make their charcuterie. We've been in the food business for over 100 years. Uh, it started by my great uncle and carried on by my dad and I joined the company some 25, 30 years ago, I guess, by now. And I was joined by my children just a few years ago. We produce all of our products. Uh, we produce some very old world products like the culatello um, and the prosciutto. And we produce some newer type of products like the brizola, which is the dry cured beef that is not very well known in the United States, but is very popular because it's a very lean piece of meat. Hi. 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 I'm Kat. I'm Johnny. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you for taking me on a tour today. I've grown up with this place, so it's kind of in my blood. Um, I've been running around the drying rooms for I, I, I don't remember when. So that's kind of where you know my love started. You kind of fall in love with this type of product. You don't really realize that it's happening. And so, what is this? This is a coppa. It's basically city shoulder that's uh, cured for uh, for over 90 days. So it uh, comes from the pork shoulder and it's stuffed. And at the end of the, it looks like this. And so the mold that's growing on the surface, can you tell me about that? The mold is very beneficial for our processes because the mold keeps the product from uh, rusting. And it also, by penetrating through the casing inside the meat, it's eating organic acids, it's, it's giving it a much, much more of the flavor. And a lot of other, like, salami makers around the, especially in America, they will apply mold to the surface, but not here. Yes, that's correct. In this plant, in this facility, we've been over for, we've been making salami for over 110 years. So we, in our aging rooms, we developed our own mold, so we, we think that we don't need to do this because we have our unique mold that comes from our aging rooms because of 110 years making the product. So it's Volpe mold. So it's pretty much Volpe mold. That's wonderful. Unique. That's wonderful. Thank God for my daughter because, because she got into, uh, into the business and with the passion and she really wants to make it. Make it for now. I hope that my grandchildren are doing the same thing. So we're looking forward to maybe another hundred years, I guess. I think to a Volpe, an artisan producer is who we are. Um, we've always had been hands-on. You know, being a family business, you wear many different hats. And artisan to me means that you are 
actually making the product, following it through the process, um, standing behind it even after it's sold. Because we don't we don't make huge amounts of volume, uh, we are by definition an artisan producer. I'm just glad that people are recognizing the quality of artisan producers now. This is Culatello. It's uh, basically, it's the best part of the prosciutto. It's the heart of the prosciutto that's uh, stuffed into the casings and it's tied by hand. And I think we are only one producer in the United States that's making culatello. Culatello is being aged for almost a year. Wow. And this is how it looks like when it's done. If you remember upstairs, you saw it. This is what it looks like. And it's how done. much of its mass does it lose? It loses for over 36, 38 to 38% 38 of wow. its own weight. It's called Genoa Salami. It's uh, stuffed in the natural casings. And what's uh, amazing about this product is uh, that uh, we have uh, used the same recipe for 110 years. We never changed the recipe. Wow. It has been always the same. Anything that we do, we should be making it our own in some form or fashion. And so when we talk about these products and they're very traditional, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have to stay that way, but we have to keep the respect and keep that tradition there. I want to, I think that Volpe should be synonymous with quality. Making a quality product is probably our most important function here. So holding on to tradition is the second. Although we are American, so we like innovation and we like to try different things, um, and we just like to hear it back from our customers that we're on the right track. So prosciutto, obviously, is one of the most traditional things that Volpe makes, but they make a range of charcuterie and everything is just fantastic. What's most interesting about the Volpe story is that now they are introducing a line of heritage breed prosciuttos that are sourced from all the Missouri and Kansas farms that they can really partner with. So each package of prosciutto is going to feature meat from only one breed of hog. It's a really, really interesting project because then you could, for example, just taste all these different prosciuttos side by side and understand the difference between like a Berkshire and a Mangalista hog. It's, it's really, really cool what they're doing. So I have salt and peppered my loin. I'm putting just a touch, just a teeny tiny bit of olive oil and then I'm going to transfer that over and wrap it all up. Now all I need to do is tie these guys off and then I'm going to pan sear this. I have just a little bit of olive oil in the pan and I'm just kind of swirling to coat. I have it at medium-high. Once it comes up to temp, then I'm going to sear this on all sides. Then what we're going to do is slice up an onion and put that in the bottom. We're going to stick it in the oven for about half an hour to roast, and that's all you have to do. All right. So I'm going to let this rest undisturbed for a couple of minutes, and then I'm going to flip it and flip it and flip it so that it gets nice and seared on all sides. So we're seared on all sides. I'm gonna quickly take this out, and just move it to the side. I'm just gonna deglaze the pan with a little bit of water. And stir that around. Get up all that wonderful, wonderful juice. And then I'm laying in my onions. The pork is just gonna sit right on top of these onions while it's cooking. It's a really simple and fun way to do pork loin. Okay, now we're putting this bad boy right back into the pan. Now I'm gonna pop this into a 375 degree oven for 
probably about 40 minutes or so until it reaches the right internal temperature and then that's it. We're gonna make a quick pan sauce and we'll be finished. You want to take your pork out of the oven just a little bit before it's entirely done because it will continue to cook with all of that residual heat as you're letting it rest and all that moisture is going to be pulled back into the roast. So while this is resting, I'm going to take the pan over to the oven and I'm going to make a quick pan sauce with a little bit of white wine. So what we've created here is a little bit of pork heaven, essentially. All of that fat from the loin as well as the prosciutto has kind of melted into the bottom of the pan along with these onions, which have cooked really, really gently. And so I'm going to add in just some dry white wine. Any dry white will do. And I'm just going to kind of cook this down and concentrate all of those flavors. And when this is finished, then we're going to slice up that pork and we're going to serve it. This cooking method really helps to preserve the moisture in the pork. You have the fat from the walnuts and the olive oil that I've put inside the stuffing, but then outside wrapping in that prosciutto really protects all of that wonderful porky goodness. So I hope that you have enjoyed our best of episode dedicated to all things pig, and I will see you next time. <laughs>